Good evening and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam and I'll be your moderator. Dr. Bethany Valahi is back with us tonight, this time reviewing 10 steps to proper ergonomic positioning. If there are any questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel and we'll reply via email within two business days. Henry Schein is also not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Dr. Valahi, take it away. Well, thank you, Adam. And it's a pleasure to be here with the Henry Schein Group to share with you my 10 steps to positioning for success in dentistry. So my involvement with dentistry comes from a physical therapy perspective. And at the age of 35, my husband, a dentist, was forced to consider selling his practice due to severe low back pain. So through a series of postural, ergonomic, and exercise strategies. 25 years later, he is still practicing full-time pain-free. So I'd like to share with you many of these evidence-based strategies to help you have the long and healthy career that you've planned for yourselves in dentistry. So we know that every team member is prone to having pain in different areas of the body, depending on your job. For instance, Assistants tend to report more low back pain due to their positioning challenges uh, chair side. Hygienists, more neck and shoulder pain due to uh, the force and the repetition that they have to use with their scaling and such. Dentists, this combination of all three, low back, neck, and shoulder pain. So, we know then that every team member needs to be educated in these areas to which they're uniquely prone to developing pain. So what is a cumulative trauma disorder? Some of you have heard of MSDs, right? That's the big buzzword. But I like the term cumulative trauma disorder because it really describes the mechanism by which these things happen in dentistry, which is an accumulation of microtrauma that happens in your body at a rate faster than your body can repair it. So your body would normally give you warning signs if you were beginning to develop one of these. So you might be gripping an instrument and you might not be able to grip it as tightly as you once could, or it might be painful to grip the instrument. Uh, you might be driving home at night and you can't look over your shoulder as well as you once could that morning, perhaps. Uh, numbness or tingling into an extremity is a warning sign. Shooting or stabbing pain and burning, swelling or inflammation. All of these things are signs that your body is trying to get you to pay attention and take some preventive action before the structural, sometimes irreversible damage occurs in your body. So what are ergonomic risk factors in the operatory? So we have a number of them here. We have prolonged static postures, which is a very, very big risk factor that leads to pain in the operatory. Mental stress. Since the introduction of COVID, we know that stress has become really amplified and that the heavy PPE is now causing headaches, dehydration, mental exhaustion, physical fatigue. And uh, that's a whole different CE course that I teach, but that is something that we need to be aware of as well. Non-neutral postures, uh, duration repetitive motions. How many scaling um, strokes do you take during the workday? Grip and force. How tightly do you have to grip the instrument? We know that there are very specific ergonomic uh, guidelines uh, to and criteria we need to be looking at when selecting curettes and hand pieces to reduce that grip and force. And finally, poorly fitted gloves. So how does pain develop in the operatory? In order to mitigate the, this progression that ends up with 
work-related pain or an injury, we need to understand the process by which this happens. So this always starts in the operatory with those six risk factors we just talked about. Um, and then the problem here is that the occupation of dentistry and hygiene is such a physically demanding occupation that usually it takes more than just ergonomics. So our ergonomic um, interventions are our first line of defense, which what, what we'll be talking about today, positioning in the operatory. However, we also need a second line of defense to address the physiological changes that inevitably happen in your body due to those risk factors, which is muscle ischemia. Muscles become deprived of oxygen and painful. Uh, we ha also have trigger points that can develop from the ischemia, inflammation in the body, Muscle imbalances, studies show that when a dentist or hygienist in the operatory leaves their most optimal upright posture, two thirds of the time they lean forward and to the right. So this leads to the development of muscle imbalances. So we need to be very aware of this and know how to select the right exercises to correct the muscle imbalances, and the right positioning strategies in the operatory to avoid those postures. Upregulated sympathetic nervous system or fight or flight response. So again, this is since the COVID pandemic, seems like everyone has an upregulated fight or flight response. We need to know how to downregulate that in the operatory with easy strategies. Um, that's another course I teach. So disc degeneration um, is another physiological change. So once we have all the strategies here to intervene uh, in these two uh, areas, we can prevent the progression to an actual injury. So five steps to practicing dentistry pain-free is how I teach this progression. First and foremost, we've got to have ergonomic strategies in the operatory. These must be evidence-based people because there is so much uh, hype and misinformation um, among some vendors about their products being truly ergonomic when they aren't. We'll talk about more about that later. Look to the research and ask for uh, resources. If somebody says something's ergonomic, show me the data, just ask. Step two, we've got to downregulate the sympathetic nervous system. If you have that fight or flight response, it's going to cause painful trigger points in the body. It's going to cause tightness in the muscles, which is going to lead to pain. The third thing we need to be doing is treating the self-treating, those myofascial trigger points. There are seven key myofascial trigger points dental professionals need to be treating and chair side stretching has been shown to be one of the most effective strategies there are 20 chair side stretches that specifically correct imbalances and finally specific home exercises and at the end of the course you'll get an opportunity to download a white paper 14 exercises that actually can cause pain in dental professionals that aren't a problem for the general public, but because of your muscle imbalances, it's a problem. All right, so here we go. You'll have an opportunity also at the end of the course today to download my free ebook, Five Steps to Practicing Dentistry Pain-Free. So what is safe posture? Safe posture, and most of you know this from uh, school, is ear over shoulder over hip, right? And so this is great if you're a computer operator, right? <laughs> really helpful advice. But if you're in the operatory, can you realistically do this? No, this is really useless information. When someone tells you to sit up straight, okay, well, 
tell me how in dentistry. So this is how we do it in dentistry. You need to know what the research tells you are safe limits. So the safe postural working range for the head is no more than 20 degrees of forward head tilt. So here is neutral, here's about 20 degrees of forward head tilt. 80% or so of loops on the market do not keep you in this safe head range. This was the subject of my doctorate study. So I'm a real kind of uh, passionate about this topic. Um, the hip angle needs to be open greater than 90 degrees. And again, one dental stool doesn't fit all. Saddle stools can actually cause pain for some people uh, with certain types of lower doses. So there, this is the 10 step patient positioning sequence. So this always starts with you, with adjusting your operator stool. Then we need to recline the patient for upper or lower arch and orient the occlusal plane. And this is going to be different depending on if you have a flat or a double articulating headrest. You need to adjust the patient chair height. One of the biggest mistakes I see in the clinic when I'm doing in office or when I'm doing virtual consultations is the patient position too high or too low. And you don't have a prayer of a good posture if this height is not correct. Head rotation, keep in mind the patient can move and hygienists are some of the best at this. You're always telling your patient, lift your chin, turn your head. So uh, we can all take a lesson from them in uh, asking for um, patient cooperation. Clock position, uh, we need to know what clock position the uh, operator should be in. Side sitting in the nine o'clock position Incredibly, it's still being taught in dental and hygiene schools. Um, this is one of the most damaging positions that a dentist or hygienist can be, uh, be in. We'll talk more about that. Delivery needs to be nearby. Lighting, overhead or head-mounted lighting. Uh, we'll talk about pros and cons. Fulcrums, inter or extra oral fulcrums. And then we're going to finish up with a head posture exercise that I created. Even if you have non ergonomic loops that put you in a really bad head posture, this can help you in improve it up to 15 degrees. All right, step number one is adjusting your operator stool. Now, in this slide, we're just going to talk about a traditional operator stool with a tilting seat pan. So this is barely going to keep most people in a neutral position, but not quite. So this really is not truly an ergonomic stool, even with a tilting seat pan, but it's what most of you have. So first, you want to adjust the backrest up or down until the most convex portion nestles in your low back. Then you want to assess the seat depth. The reason this is important is because up to about 15 years ago, I would say 75% of the dental stools on the market were designed for the average European man. Okay, six foot or so. Who pulls up two thirds of the time chair side today? It's a woman, right? So fortunately people are getting uh, options for shorter seat pans and the manufacturers are making chairs with shorter seat pans. So let's do a little exercise to assess your seat depth. I want you to, um, after you have moved the backrest, move the backrest away from your back. And then you're going to place three fingers behind the back of your knee. So right here, place three fingers behind the back of your knee once you've scooted all the way back on the chair. And if your closest finger touches the edge of the seat, the chair, the seat pan is too deep for you and you should choose a seat with a shorter seat pan. 
Finally, uh, you're going to tilt the seat very slightly forward, but not so much where, so you feel like you're sliding off. Armrest height should be adjusted so you're not elevating your shoulders. The height of the chair needs to be adjusted though, so thighs are sloping slightly downward. And the adjustment, again, is going to depend on your lumbar curve. So again, one, one adjustment does not fit all people. If you have a saddle style stool, um, there's many different types of saddle stools on the market. As I mentioned early, uh, earlier, some saddle stool, for saddle stools can actually cause low back pain for some people with certain types of lordosis. So definitely want to assess your lumbar curvature. You want to take into account the six factors for selecting a stool. This is not a course on equipment selection. This is on positioning. So that is a different course altogether. A saddle stool should be adjusted so your thighs are sloping down at about a 45 degree angle. And if you have a backrest, you want to adjust it optimally forward. Most people are going to want to keep the seat flat on a saddle stool, not tilted forward. There are a few exceptions to this, and this is why um, I teach a separate course on dental stool selection and low back pain, because you have all these factors to consider. So if you're interested, that is a separate CE course, how to select a dental stool. We're just talking about positioning today. So step two is reclining the patient. So for the lower arch, we know that the patient needs to be in the semi-supine position. So only uh, 10 to 20 degrees elevated from the true supine. The most common mistake I see here is the patient is elevated too far. And then you don't have any hope of a, tr a good uh, neutral posture because you're contorting around the patient. For the uh, upper arch, of course, the true supine position. Now, if you take only one thing away from this course, it would be this, that the orientation of the occlusal plane of the patient directly dictates your posture. And here's what I mean by that. When the patients, let's say, um, the, we're looking at the upper arch here. So you can imagine here that the upper arch of this patient on the left side of the screen is angled forward in front of the vertical, right? This causes you to have to lean forward. But when we get the patient's neck extended back and we get the occlusal plane in front of the vertical, this dramatically improves your posture. So we're going to be talking about two different types of headrests here, a double articulating headrest and a flat headrest, because the guidelines to adjusting them are very different. For a double articulating headrest, you want to first and foremost adjust this headrest so the uh, the headrest is angled steeply downward. And this is for the upper arch, of course. Now you're going to ask the patient to scoot up until you're comfortable. And this is another one of the biggest mistakes I see is um, operators will adjust the headrest down because they know they know they're supposed to do that. But then the patient isn't properly positioned in there. Then they become uncomfortable. Then they don't tolerate supine. And then everything goes uh, in not a good direction. So. Make sure that you ask the patient to scoot up until they're comfortable when they do this. They're going to put the edge of the headrest right below the occiput, which is where it's most comfortable for them. Don't ever try to adjust this for the patient because you're gonna miss most of the time. And then the patient is gonna be uncomfortable. They aren't gonna tolerate the treatment and then you have to contort your posture. All right. so. Checking for proper positioning. This is the mirror handle test I teach at OHSU School of Dentistry. And this is where I have the students flip their mirrors around and place the handle of the mirror on the occlusal plane 
of the upper arch. So at the beginning of the practicum, I asked the students to visualize the occlusal of number three, for instance. Every year, 75 heads go like this. Okay, and that's with a mirror. Okay, that's with a mirror. They're contorting that much. I'll say now let's take Dexter, the typodont, and let's extend his head so that the until the occlusal plane is behind the vertical and they've got their mirror handle on the occlusal plane. They can visualize this from the side. And then after they get that occlusal plane 20 to, 30, uh, 20 to 25 degrees behind the vertical, let's try visualizing the occlusal of number three again. Every year, 75 heads go from this to almost perfectly neutral upright posture, okay? This is how dramatically the orientation of the occlusal plane impacts your posture. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, my patient would never tolerate that, right? Yes, they will. Let me show you how. So if you improve the comfort of the patient, you're going to improve their tolerance to being reclined, which then improves your posture. So we, you notice right here where this red arrow is, that there is no support in the cervical spine. This is a problem. We know as physical therapists that when we lay a patient supine and there's no support in that cervical curve, that that translates to muscle spasm and tension in the cervical musculature. Is this something you want to create in your patients? No. So we need to support that cervical musculature and you can get a dental cushion to stick in there. Now, I don't like generic cushions because nine out of 10 of these ones that I've seen uh, from, I don't know, Relax the Back Store or Bought Online are too large. And then they actually force the chin down and the head forward. Well, now you're just completely um, negating any positive ergonomic benefits you had from the headrest. So that's why I say get a ergonomic headrest. Two companies make these, Metaposture and Crescent. Okay, they, they're both very similar. There's not much difference. Metaposture and Crescent products make these headrests. Here, the large one is for flat headrests. The smaller one is for double articulating headrests. So, if you have a flat headrest, you're gonna ask the patient to scoot all the way to the end of the headrest. The reason you wanna do this, right, is because if you treat the patient when they're scooted down in the headrest, you have all this extra headrest space that you have to either lean over or reach over, neither one is a good option, right? So ask the patient to scoot to the end, the edge of their head is flush with the end of the headrest. Now they're gonna be out of alignment with the contours of the chair, right? So this is a problem, but it's not, it's easily resolved. You can, you have ergonomic, dental ergonomic cushions that this, these companies I told you about manufacture. You put the one in the cervical curve, one in the lumbar area because they've scooted up. Most of them are not going to be supported right in the chair and a knee cushion. If you get those three, I guarantee your patients will dramatically, um, the incidence of objecting and uh, will be dramatically reduced and the patients will tolerate uh, being reclined much further. So double articulating headrest versus flat headrest for the lower arch. Now we're using the horizontal plane as a guideline. So you're going to do your mirror handle test. And this time it's in relation to the 
occlusal plane of the lower arch. So you, it should be about 30 to 40 degrees. Up. And notice how with the double articulating headrest, you're simply bringing that forward. Um, flat headrest, of course, you, you can't bring, adjust it forward. So you have to raise the whole backrest, which uh, doesn't have as many ergonomic benefits. Adjusting the height of the patient chair. So we want the forearms to be angled slightly upward, only about zero to 10 degrees. So this is very slight. If you angle the, if you position the patient higher than this, you're going to have elevated shoulders. If you position them lower than this, you're going to be have a rounded upper back leaning forward. So this has to be correct. Rotating the head. So the patient, again, can rotate the head and really help you with uh, positioning. So they can rotate the head. They can also side the bend, side bend the head on a flat headrest. Now, clock position. Very, very important that your line of sight needs to be perpendicular to the tooth surface or quadrant. And this can be indirect or direct, doesn't matter. So the goal here is that 70% of your treatment is coming from the 11 to 12 o'clock position. So make sure that you are uh, assessing uh, where, what clock position, you can get a perpendicular line of sight um, to the tooth surface. Like for the lingual of nine, number 19, for instance, you're going to be in the nine o'clock position, right? Um, so again, never side sit in the nine o'clock position unless you are treating the posterior lower right quadrant of the patient. And then hygienists, you can side sit for five to 10% of the time. That's it, okay? Now, clearance in the 12 o'clock position, you, you've got to have it. If you're gonna have a long and healthy career, you've gotta have uh, clearance in the 12 o'clock position because as we just said in the previous slide, your goal here is to deliver 70% of your treatment from the 11 to 12 o'clock position. So you gotta have clearance. Now, the industry standard for clearance in the 11 to 12 o'clock position should, when you're between the headrest of the, the edge of the headrest and a counter or delivery system, it needs to be at least 20 to 22 inches. So you can scoot in there and work from that position. Here's an example of an operatory uh, down in Colorado that only had about 13 inches of clearance. And all the team members were working in the 10 o'clock position all day long. 10 o'clock is one of the most damaging positions that you can work in because you're either going to be reaching over a, a chest, reaching over a forehead. So you've got to uh, fix this. So what did we do? We scooted the patient chair down toward the foot of the uh, chair. But did that give us enough room? No, because what's down there? It's always going to be an electrical box or a plug, right? So we only gained about two inches here. So what else did we do? We had to rotate the patient's chairs, right? About 20 degrees or so counterclockwise. And then all the, all the team members could get into that 12 o'clock position and work in a very good optimal posture. So selecting a patient chair, I have a whole slew of ergonomic uh, criteria for selecting patient chairs, but we're just going to talk about the most important two here today. And one of those is uh, they should all allow easy access to the oral cavity. 
One of these, and the most important by far, in my opinion, is a narrow upper backrest. And when I talk about a narrow upper backrest, I mean narrow right across here at the shoulders. The reason this is so important is what is the first thing that impedes your um, proximity to the patient when you're in the eight, nine, or 10 o'clock position? Because you're going to have to go there some of the time, right? It is the edge of the chair, right? So these chairs that have big wide wings really limit close positioning, not only for the dentist and hygienist, for the assistant as well. Their edge of their chair, um, I guarantee you the edge of the patient chair is limiting their proximity. So a small thin headrest is the other thing to look for in patient chairs. Uh, again, there's many, many more things. Uh, we only have an hour here today and I've got 12 hours of education. So we're just gonna hit uh, the, the highlights. Patient chair modifications. One thing you can do is actually replace the headrest and get a different headrest um, because some of these chairs that have flat headrests, by now, hopefully you've all realized flat headrest is pretty non-ergonomic, right? Because you have no um, ability to, you have no control of the occlusal plane with a flat headrest. So you can get a double articulating headrest or um, on a chair that has a very wide wings and limits your access to the oral cavity, you can actually retrofit that backrest with a narrower pedo backrest. This is what we did with one of our patient chairs in our operatory. And then we kept that one wide chair in one of the operatories for our very large patients. Step seven is getting your delivery system nearby. So we want the delivery system to be within close proximity. So we want it to be within forearm reach like this, okay? Not out here, <laughs> extended forearm. So within easy fingertip reach. Rear delivery systems were originally designed for true four-handed dentistry. And what that means is that uh, the assistant is making all the transfers, um, changing all the burrs on the hand pieces, and the doctor is never having to twist to one side to retrieve instruments because Research shows repeated twisting in one direction can lead to low back pain. So hygienists, some of you have already figured this out. When you have a rear delivery system, you retrieve the instrument with your non-dominant hand and then transfer it to your dominant hand, right? So this is a um, one easy thing to do, but really um, dentists, if you have a rear delivery system, you need to have that assistant all trained up with true forehanded dentistry. So you're never having to twist and retrieve and change your own burrs. And I guarantee your productivity is going to take a little jump. So when you do this, so, and it just makes sense, right? Side delivery. So side delivery is uh, fine for hygiene. It's okay for forehanded dentistry, but keep in mind, what is the assistant doing in this picture here? Can she reach the hand pieces to change the burrs on the hand pieces? Can she reach some of the, um, those hand, those, um, instruments? No, she can't. So, um, it's may limit productivity in that sense, but for hygiene, this works really well, but you've got to remember to keep the delivery system close to you and don't uh, leave it back in the eight or nine o'clock position when you're in the 11 to 12 o'clock position. Over the patient delivery, I think it's kind of the creme de la creme of deliveries uh, in that you can reach all the instruments and hand pieces, both the assistant and dentist can reach all the hand position, all the uh, instruments and hand pieces from any clock position. 
So um, now everything has its caveats and over the patient is no different. So there's always the fear factor, right? That the patient uh, doesn't want to see the equipment. It creates more anxiety. Um, so those things need to be taken into consideration as well. Lighting is the eighth step. So your overhead light should parallel your line of sight as closely as possible. Okay, this may be radical and this certainly is not what you were probably taught in school. Most of you were taught that the overhead light should be angled up over the patient's chest for the um, upper arch and positioned over the patient's mouth for the lower arch. That is really outdated um, guidelines because the newest guidelines um, in the last 10 years coming from UBC in Canada from Dr. Lance Rucker shows us that the most effective lighting for the overhead light parallels your line of sight as closely as possible, which means it needs to be slightly behind and to one side of your head, right? So this is the same theory why head mounted light is so effective because it parallels the most closely with your line of sight. Finally, finger fulcrums. We know that in North America, most dentists and hygienists have more pain on the non-dominant mirror or retracting side than on the dominant shoulder. So dentists and hygienists, you tend to be really good at finger fulcruming on the dominant side, but on the non-dominant side, I think a lot of you just forget, okay? So remember, you've got to have an inter or extra oral fulcrum on that non-dominant side. Okay, and there is a head posture exercise that is going, it can dramatically improve your posture um, because 80% of the loops on the market are non-ergonomic. It's really helpful to know um, an exercise that can improve your head posture um, if you do have one of these types of loops. So uh, what the exercise consists of is you, and you can put your loops on if you want, you're going to be looking at an object at eye level straight in front of you. And you can put your thumbnails together here and kind of approximate the oral cavity. Okay, so you're looking at your thumbnails. Now you're going to look, put your head up straight ahead and look straight ahead. And now you're gonna roll your eyeballs down without moving your head. And then you're going to dip your chin just until you see the oral cavity. Now that is going to feel a whole lot different than um, the way you usually work for most of you because a natural tendency as human beings, what we do is we just lean the head forward until we see whatever we're looking at beneath us. So that, that translates into a lot of stress at C5, C6, which is where mis most disc herniation occurs. <clears throat> All right, for hygienists and microscope um, positioning, I have a slightly modified guidelines. Most hygienists don't have time to move the backrest up and down and change their whole position um, during a treatment. So with a flat headrest or a double articulating headrest, always start, just position the patient so the backrest is at 10 degrees elevated, period, okay? No matter what type of chair you have. Flat headrest, double articulating headrest, the backrest is 10 degrees elevated. Then for a flat headrest, you're going to have to elevate that backrest slightly up and down to control the occlusal plane, right? And for the double articulating headrest, this is much more effective now because you can use the headrest 
to position it slanted down for the upper arch and angled forward for the lower arch. Wheelchair patients can be some of the most challenging population that you have as patients, but if you have a double articulating headrest, you can be very well set for treating these patients because you simply um, turn the chair about 20 to 30 degrees to one side, back the wheelchair up to it, and you extend that double articulating headrest uh, to support the patient's head. Pedo patients. So pedo patients can also be some of the most difficult and challenging to treat. So we need to get the kids' heads up into the double articulating headrest. So look at this picture here. This dot, this um, assistant here is really contorting more than she needs to because this kid's head is not properly positioned in this double articulating headrest. So the way we can fix this is with something called a pedo booster. And this gets their head up into the double articulating headrest. You need to make it happen. So the kids are going to be more comfortable and you're going to be more comfortable. Now, what about our geriatric population? you need to support this kyphosis, right? So when these patients have a thoracic spine that's fused into this kyphotic posture, you need to support it. It's no wonder that these geriatric patients, when we put them on a flat backrest and headrest, that they start to freak out when they go back. It's not comfortable, right? Because their spine is fused in a forward position. So what we can do is support the kyphosis with a geriatric pillow, okay? So this is called an osteo pillow. Crescent makes one of these. Metaposture also makes one of these. Alternating between standing and sitting is very, very important. This works great for a tallest, a tall dentist working with a medium to short assistant. Um, obviously, it's a recipe for disaster for a short dentist working with a tall assistant. So um, alternating between standing and sitting has been shown to prevent low back pain. So make this a, uh, if you're just starting, just make a decision right now you're going to stand for all your injections. That will be a good place to start, okay? Stand for all your injections, and then you can go from there. All right, so we have looked at about one twelfth of my education today, um, positioning and the operatory. And so this is um, ergonomics in the operatory. We still have many more steps to learn here to practice, to have a long and pain-free career. So we've only covered a small portion of step number one. So I'd like to offer you a webinar bonus here to kind of fill in the gaps of the information we didn't uh, get to touch on today. My free ebook talks about all five steps and strategies to use to um, optimize your health. Um, I have the actual video of the head posture exercise for you that you can share with the team a white paper that shows the, the 14 exercises dental professionals should avoid, and my list of what research shows and from my doctorate studies show are truly ergonomic loops that can help prevent neck pain, not cause it. So if you're interested in signing up for this, you can text on your phone, 55444, and enter the word wellness. Or you can just go to this URL, posturedonics.com backslash bonus. So I thank you for joining me here today. I wish you all a wonderful, healthy, and safe fall. And you're going to find many more evidence-based dental ergonomic and wellness CE courses on my website at posturedonics.com. Thanks for joining me and practice in good health. Thank you, Dr. Valahi, for sharing this really important information on ergonomics. 
And as a thank you for attending, everyone will receive this recording via email sometime in the next week. Thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you back here soon. Have a great night.